Ron has a, a microphone here, or Shane does, somebody's got it. There it is. If you got a question for the, for the panel or one of the panelists, raise your hand. Not everybody all at once. <laughs> Well, let me ask uh, a quick question, and both of you maybe can, can uh, to get us started here. Okay. What is your top concern within the church when it comes to worldview issues? Uh, where do you see us, you know, the church being the weakest? Uh, what do you think we can do to address that? Biblical ignorance. I mean, just uh, that would be it. Uh, especially I say that in light of this recent poll that came out that revealed the incredible extent of the simple unacquaintance of most people who profess to be born again, evangelical Christians, even those who attend church with great regularity, even those who say that it's important to read their Bibles and to pray and to share their faith with other people, when they actually are asked questions about biblical content, the vast majority of them show unbelievable ignorance of the content of scripture. I, I mentioned last night at dinner uh, with you that when I was teaching ethics in seminary, in seminary, and this was a second year course in seminary, first day of my ethics class, I would hand out a sheet of paper to all the students and I would say, please just list, you don't have to do them in order and you don't have to write them out in full or anything, just list an abbreviated form of the Ten Commandments. And on average, they could do about five or five and a half commandments per guy. And uh, I, it was about four years before I got one who knew all the Ten Commandments. And yet, these men are all men who would say they loved Psalm 1. Uh, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And when they told me they delighted in that, but they didn't even, couldn't even list the Ten Commandments, I said, you're a bunch of liars. I, you know, I gave them a trigger warning first, you know, so they knew that they didn't have safe space. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the first assignment for the course was they had to come back the next day having memorized all Ten Commandments in their full text. But biblical ignorance is my greatest concern. I agree with that and, and uh, perhaps piggyback on it. We have a death of systematic thought. Um, Postmodernism is a term that's overused at times, but the idea that there isn't really truth to be found in the scripture, A, and if there is, there's no belief that there are organizing principles or thoughts. Um, people's worldview uh, that they think is derived from scripture is sort of like someone, they have a puzzle, it's all in the pieces, and it's, it's in the box, and they're missing the picture, and they have no idea how to organize it. So, in and part of the reason, I think, uh, the ignorance of scripture derives a bit because they don't think they need to have a well-organized, yeah. systematic thought. So, um, scriptural, and then Christocentric, all the universe, everything revolves around Christ. Uh, look at Paul's whatsoever's. Uh, whatsoever you do, whether in word or deed, do you all to the glory of God. And then are in 2 Corinthians 10, uh, tearing down all these imaginations and strongholds that set themselves up against God. But notice the parallel that follows, bringing every thought captive, or captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. So it's Christocentric. Uh, I, I recommend to people what you need to do, uh, among other things, is get a good systematic theology and read that so you have some organization to these things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Especially coming out now and you know, all the campaigning for election time, that you know, what is politically correct, which has been going on for 15, 20 years now, is the right thing to do. It's circumventing all other types of thinking. And it's, as I said from the very beginning, it's pretty much unethical, anti-Christian, many times anti-moral, you know, be, to be politically correct. Do you see 
any way to circumvent that and as we discuss with people our politics to circumvent political correctness or yes yeah, uh, yeah um, be a Christian <laughs> um, speak the truth John says you know, I have no greater joy than to know that my children are walking in the truth um, speak the truth speak it with love yes uh, but remember the definition of love in scripture is the fulfillment of God's law Romans 13 10 uh, yes love is patient love is kind all of that stuff both those are the characteristics but the definition is the fulfillment of God's law so speak the truth in love live in obedience to the law of God and do justice love mercy and walk humbly with your God you will be utterly politically incorrect and you'll also be uh, I think walking in a manner that pleases the Lord. I'll just add, um, who defines what is correct? Uh, Romans 13, regarding that body politic, the, the, that one placed there by God is the minister of God unto thee for good. So who defines what's good, what's evil, what's correct, what's the nature of a society? So rather than circumventing it, I just uh, put a stake right through its temple, and that's one of those high and lofty imaginations that are set up against God. Yeah. Um, frequently when I'm talking to um, younger generation, um, many of them, when I mention something from the Bible, say, well, that was a long time ago. It's not really relevant in today's age. How do you respond to them with love and, and convincingly? Well, I would ask them to tell me some things that they believe. And then I would tell them of various people who believed the same thing thousands of years ago and say, by your own standards, you have no reason to believe what you believe either. If the age of an idea is the determinant of its worth, uh, then if you're going to criticize the Bible because it's old, you have to criticize your own beliefs because they're old too. Because as the Bible says, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, so you have to come up with a different criterion for judging the truth or the falsehood of beliefs. And then of course you, you move into, I think, a presuppositional apologetic that that tells us without the uh, propositional revelation of God, uh, there's no basis for any knowledge claims at all. Uh, it's obviously, it's a complex thing to go through, but uh, I'm a firm believer in, in epistemological judo and jujitsu, uh, show the self-refuting character of all anti-Christian thought. Could you go explain, give an example of maybe how you do that? Well, um, you know, the pleasure principle, the, the notion that, uh, that uh, really uh, um, bringing pleasure to myself and others is my chief end is certainly not a new thing. You can go back to the Epicureans for that. Um, you can go well before them. Uh, or or a, a power principle you can find power principle thinking in Baalism and, uh, and in the ancient Egyptian religions. Um, you know, whatever that young person comes up with, uh, and maybe, maybe I don't know when he first comes up with it, what it is that was the thousands of years ago precursor, well then I have a, a bit of homework to do, don't I? but I can find it out and come back to him and say, you know what, you told me that you think such and such. I just learned that so-and-so 2,000 years ago was saying the same thing. Now, according to you, the Bible doesn't, you know, is, isn't all that worthwhile because it's so old. Well, then what's the matter with your, your thinking? How come you don't apply the same criterion there? Pastor Erickson, do you have any thoughts on, on uh reaching millennials and younger generation with Christian worldview and, and when they're talking about the issue of, you know, is it relevant? Scripture. And then our Lord Jesus Christ prayed in the garden 
unto God the Father, asking, praying, uh, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. So bring them to the scriptures. Uh, bring them to a good systematic understanding and reading of the scriptures. Uh, they must, must be uh, steeped in the word of God, not just reading the text, oh, how does that make you feel today, or this or that, but a systematic reading and a Christocentric reading, which of course then reveals God the Father. Uh, so I'd say go to the scriptures. Uh, many people, they'll make all kinds of arguments and they'll pull a verse here or there and they just use it to assuage their own consciences or tickle their fancy. So to the scripture, to the scripture, to the scripture. Transformed by the renewing of their minds must be by the scripture. I, I would add the one other thing, and that is, um, and I think perhaps we in the Reformed community, precisely because I think we have such a, a strong systematic uh, foundation for much of our thinking, we perhaps are weak in this regard, and that is that we're great at telling the truth, we're great at telling it like it is, we're great at confrontation. We tend not to be so great at the, uh, literally the hug, you know, and, and compassion, gentleness, meekness, uh, humility, warmth, love. You know, those things are really important. Jesus said that men would know that we are his disciples because we love one another. And frankly, I think a lot of, even, of, of young millennials see the degree of, of nastiness among Christians toward each other for whatever reasons, doctrinal reasons or social reasons or whatever. And they're thoroughly turned off by that and I don't blame them at all. all right, I think more than anything I was referring to non-believers that uh, you're trying to talk to and you make a comment and they they respond negatively because they feel that it's irrelevant. Yeah. But even within the Christian uh, faith, I occasionally have run into people that have, um, you've made a comment and they say, well, we don't believe that particular segment is relevant today, which to me is very disturbing. I, I take them again to the scriptures. An awful lot, what I want to do is to introduce them to Jesus. Let them get to know what Jesus is like. Uh, I, I think of, of uh, oh, come on, what's her name? Uh, the, uh, uh, the lesbian, uh, yeah, Rosaria Butterfield, who, you know, hated Christianity because of the picture she had of it. And when she was challenged by, <laughs> ironically, the chairman of her literature department, you know, you have the tools of literary critique, read the Bible and show that it is as misogynistic and hateful as you say that it is. And she read it and read it and read it again and again. And she got to know God, she got to know Jesus. She saw a wholly different picture, a wholly different picture. I, th I think that's what we need to do. We need to lead them to Jesus, show them Jesus again and again. They see someone they couldn't imagine before because he's not at all like what the left describes him to be. Uh, we've had in the past several years uh, an economic, uh, Keynesian economic theory that has dumped billions of dollars into the economy. Trillion. And is that the, and, and not to mention the debt, but is that the best way to encourage freedom and individual growth and, and, and advancement? Absolutely not. Keynesianism, Keynesianism is organized theft. Inflation is the sneakiest kind of theft that there is. And Keynesianism is basically using inflation as a tool of, of economic policy. Uh, <laughs> I'll just recommend a book to you that I happen to be 12% of the way through, according to my Kindle, uh, Trumped, 
A Nation on the Brink of Ruin and How to Bring It Back by David Stockman, who was an economic advisor to President Reagan. The book just came out this summer. Uh, and he's not a supporter of Donald Trump, by the way, but he points out that Donald Trump has, has uh, really understood what's happening in flyover America. The, the highly Keynesian, super uh, monetarist policy uh, that has ruled the Federal Reserve now for the last 30 years has resulted in amazing enrichment of the financial elites on the two coasts. And it has resulted in the actual decline of, of uh, in, in terms of constant dollars, the decline of income for the vast majority of Americans uh, in flyover country, so to speak. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we, we need to adopt a sound money policy uh, to get away from that kind of thing. Uh, when we do, you'll see an immense collapse of a lot of the financial markets because they're a, they're a big fat bubble. Um, but until that comes, uh, the problem will just get worse and worse. The bigger, the longer we wait, the bigger the collapse will be. I would just add that the scriptures have quite a bit to say they sure regarding do. economics, property, law, thou shalt not steal, man shall not where neither shall he eat, nor shall the government take money from those that do to those that refuse. I mean, a lot of different aspects of economics are, are treated in the scripture. And I, I'd mentioned some people are now trying to teach, well, the Bible only has uh, things to say or for the church or for your uh, immediate salvation. I point out that before Adam ever sinned in the garden, he had special revelation from God in order to understand his world and understand his tasks. So the scriptures have much to say uh, pertaining to governments and the economy. Yeah, and that one textual variant on the Eighth Commandment, uh, you shall not steal unless you are the government, th that's not <laughs> I have a professor that I go back and forth with constantly who likes to tell me that Jesus was a socialist. Um, and I know exactly how I respond to him every single time. Um, and we get into fairly friendly, sometimes heated arguments over it, but I'm curious as to what you two gentlemen, how you would respond to that. Well, um, first just let me recommend, I have a booklet online called Social Justice, How Good Intentions Undermine Justice and Gospel. If you just Google my name plus social justice, you ought to come to that very quickly. Uh, you can read the whole booklet in PDF there online. Um, <laughs> Jesus said he didn't come to abolish the law but to fulfill it. Uh, and part of the law is you shall not steal. That presupposes the reality, the, the right of private property. Private comes from the word privare, to, to deprive, to set off uh, as not accessible to others. Uh, and so now there are a number of different passages in the Bible that socialists will appeal to as supposedly supporting their position. The sabbatical year law, the jubilee year law, the, uh, the um, <coughs> excuse me, the, the communal community of property, in the early church in Jerusalem in Acts 2 and 4, and then the Pauline collections for Jerusalem where Paul actually says the goal is equality. Uh, of course, if we exegete that carefully, we find that the goal is not the equal economic condition of the two communities, but rather that the one has shared out of its abundance, which is spiritual, to the other out of, in its need, which is economic, and the other has shared out of its abundance, which is economic, to the other to, uh, according to its need, which is economic. Um, so uh, you have to look at those passages and show why they do not in fact support a socialist sort of an interpretation. Uh, I first dealt with those back in my book Prosperity and Poverty, The Compassionate Use of Resources in a World of Scarcity, which came out in 1988. Uh, but the social justice booklet is, is uh, I think, an easier way to grapple with that. Uh, and it's online free. The parable comes to mind of the uh, the workers 
hired at different times yeah. of the day, and our Lord specifically states that it's his money to do with what he will, and if he hired someone at the 11th hour, he could pay them what he would. Socialism's wrong on so many levels, <laughs> it, it's uh, sometimes hard just to pick here and there. Obviously, you know, take the professor when you can to the scriptures as to what it teaches of the very nature of government itself. What is government there for? Is it there to manipulate markets? Or, and that also a great confusion uh, between what, what is my personal duty, Paul says, labor with your hands that you might give to those in need, an individual. Of course, socialism always confuses individual activity with, with a, a collective uh, government uh, activities and duties constantly. Constantly looking at the uh, you know aspects of generosity or sharing or voluntary sharing and say now see this must be by force of the sword and gun and the task of government so he, he doesn't understand what government is at all. Uh, ask him to quote you specific passages of what Jesus said that he says support socialism. Then look at those passages carefully within their context and just point out how they don't. You know, the typical thing is to say, well, look what he told to the rich young ruler. He should sell everything that he had and give it to the poor. Yeah, the very next chapter, we hear about Zacchaeus, the tax collector who had been overcharging people. And when he repented, he said, I'm going to repay everything that I stole to people and I'm going to give away half of my goods. And Jesus said, Today salvation has come to this house. And he called this tax collector a son of Abraham, a child of Abraham, uh, indicating that he had faith because Abraham is the father of the faithful. Right? So in the one man's life, complete divestment was necessary because he had made money his God. In the other man's life, complete divestment was not necessary. And so Jesus' instructions to the two men, or his commendation to the one, his instruction to the other, differed because of the different circumstances in their lives. Socialism fails to make those distinctions uh, among people precisely because it sees people as interchangeable cogs in a machine. Yes, we've got about five minutes left, and I just want each of you to respond to something that, that we're seeing kind of crop up more and more within evangelical circles, is this idea of pushing red-letter Christianity. Uh, Dr. Tony, <laughs> Dr. Tony Campolo is, is a, uh, and Shane Claiborne and some others are, are ones who, who promote this. How would you respond to that? I really like what Jesus says. I really do, and frankly, if these guys would would more carefully exegete what's, what Jesus said, uh, said uh, their red letter Christianity would, would demolish their socialism. Uh, but of course they don't do that. They go to the red letters because there's less text that they have to mess up there. You know? um, uh, no, Jesus is the word, right? And he owned the entire Old Testament as his word. And he told his disciples that the Holy Spirit would call to their remembrance all that he had taught them and ensure that what they taught would be his word as well. So red letter Christianity is essentially uh, um, at war with the living word and the inscripturated word. Uh, and it, it brings upon it the judgment that you hear of in the book of Revelation to anyone who takes away from this word. I'm taken to one of those so-called red letter verses. Uh, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. Jesus, taking the Old Testament there, and in his own words, every word of the Lord. So even in their own theory, it reduces to absurdity because Jesus says every word. And Jesus surely was not a red letter Christian because when the devil tempted him in the garden, in, in, the, uh, in the desert, not in the garden, uh, when the devil tempted him, every one of his quotations came from the Old Testament. So I, I think we should follow his example. That makes me a red letter Christian, I guess. <laughs> we talked at, uh, earlier about 
the millennials in, in particular. And uh, one of the concerns that, that I have, uh, let's, let's take for example the life issue. It's my understanding that millennials on the whole are much more pro-life uh, than, other, than other age groups. Um, but they're getting there uh, through, shall we say, scientific means. They're, they're looking at these highly uh, developed uh, ultrasounds with this you know, magnificent resolution they have nowadays, and they're saying, that's a baby. Exactly. And, and of course, they're right, it is a baby. But they're not getting there uh, through philosophical or theological or principial grounds. And so, uh, maybe we're covering old ground, because I know you, you guys addressed this a, a bit already. But what can we do to, to proclaim, especially to the young people, the necessity of having a biblical principle upon which these things are founded as opposed to you know, whatever comes up uh, through some other means? Uh, well, we, we mentioned the red letter Christianity. Think of uh, Campalo. Uh, who, uh, who changed his views on homosexuality on the ground that he met a lot of nice homosexuals. Mm -hmm. Not on his understanding of scripture. He changed his view on homosexuality because he met them and said, boy, these are sure nice people. How do we address that? Speed round two. He's asked me to go first. Um, the bulk of those millennials have been educated in the, the uh, atheistic state system. I mean, right. they almost have to deprogram first. Yes. Uh, you know, everything is said as far as approaching them in love, you know, so on and so forth, certainly applies. But it, it's the age old question Pilate asked our Lord what is truth? They have no concept that there is truth, uh, they have no concept that there is a source for truth. And so they don't really look for it. And they're not, of course, pressed by society to do so. So take them back to the scripture, to the truth, and plus whatever arguments they come up against that are contrary to that will reduce to absurdity. But again, encourage them regarding there is truth, there is the God of truth, and we may know it. The hidden things, they belong to the Lord. The things uh, that he has revealed belong to us and our, our children, as, as the scriptures say. So if it's in the Bible, it's in there so that we would know it. Not to say we can exhaust uh, a knowledge of God who is incomprehensible and fills us with awe and wonder, but what is revealed in the scriptures is for us to know. Yeah. I, I would add to that um, a couple different things. One, God made a universe, not a pluriverse, and his moral reality and his physical reality are consistent with each other, and so we should actually, I think, celebrate the fact that the scientific study of the unborn is showing increasingly what they really are. But then we have to point out to these young people, you cannot jump from what something is to moral obligation. The is to ought transition cannot be done. You have to have propositional uh, authoritative statement from somewhere. And so, okay, so now we've figured out that this thing in the womb at eight months or, or at, at eight weeks is a real human being. Does that imply that you shouldn't kill it? Well, only if we don't think you should kill, kill human beings. But if we think euthanasia is okay, if we think that, that uh, you know, an environmental attitude that says, look, we need to slow population growth, and part of how we do that is by preventing economic development so that death rates remain high or something like that. Uh, that kind of thinking is quite consistent. It's consistently wrong, but it's consistent. So part of what we need to do is to help these young people to recognize that even though they see what's in there, they don't know our obligations to it except from some other source. And then we have to start probing, and we have to help them to start probing and asking, how is it that I know what I ought to do toward what's in there, all right? Um, uh, his remark about the public education and the fruit of that among these young people, uh, I was thinking of just the same as, as, as uh, when I was listening to the question. Um, we really are in deep trouble 
because of the overwhelmingly secularist uh, worldview and epistemology that's been imbibed by our young people for the last 40 years, 50 years. Uh, you know, Jay Gresham Machen was absolutely right to say that public education or government schooling is inconsistent with liberty. The way I like to put it is, who in his right mind ever thought it made any sense whatsoever to entrust to the government the shaping of the minds of the people by, whom it, by whose consent it's supposed to govern? You know, government education is, is the straight path to tyranny, and so it's no surprise that it was part of the Communist Manifesto. Thank you, gentlemen.